Welcome to Asset TV. 2021 was an eventful year for all assets. With 2022 upon us, there's plenty to discuss on the market as well as the macro and micro front. Joining me today for an update on gold and gold equities is Edcoin Senior Managing Director of Global Sales at Sprott. Ed, great to have you here today. Thanks for having me. Well, we have a very exciting discussion plan, but before we get into it, can you tell us a little bit about Sprott? Sure, sure. So Sprott's a unique firm in that, you know, we focus exclusively on precious metals. Um, if you think about a lot of firms, they may have a precious metals fund or a, few, a suite of funds, but that's not their primary focus. For over four decades now, Sprott has focused exclusively on precious metals. Um, what's unique about that is that it's allowed us to really have a full suite of offerings. So not only on the physical side, but the equity side, even the debt and, 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 um, and the brokerage side, we do everything in precious metals. So you know, with over 19 billion in assets, being a publicly traded company, both on the New York Stock Exchange and the Toronto Stock Exchange under the ticker symbol SII, um, we really cover the waterfront. So we allow investors to allocate directly to physical gold, um, physical silver, a combination of gold and silver, uh, even platinum and palladium, and more recently, uranium, which we'll talk about a little today. Um, we also have a, uh, an active mutual fund, the Sprott Gold Equity Fund, uh, managed by John Hathaway and Doug Groh, uh, which is an active approach to the equities. And we also have factor-based ETFs that give you exposure to both the senior or large cap mining companies, as well as the junior small cap mining companies. And then, as I mentioned, we, uh, we provide lending uh, predominantly for um, operating leverage purposes, to mostly mid to junior type mining companies to help grow their business. And then we have that brokerage business as well. So um, we are a very unique firm in that regard. Um, over the years, we've had nice growth because more and more investors, as they look to get educated on precious metals, we're finding more and more of them are turning to Sprott for that. So we're excited uh, for the next generation of our firm and, and what we've done and, and how we're doing it. Well, Ed, I think you've given us a great overview of Sprott. So I want to ask you about mining, since you mentioned that keyword. Sure. Uh, we've seen plenty of action across uh, different asset classes, whether we're talking about precious metals, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. equities or commodities. But it does look as though mining stocks have stalled. So can you walk us through what we're seeing right now? Sure. I mean, a lot of it goes back to the narrative that you're seeing in the market. You know, the Fed has been talking about tapering for the better part of the year. Um, the Fed has been talking about potentially raising rates sometime in the next year or two. Um, and, and there's this old saying in, in traditional stocks where you, uh, you buy the rumor, sell the news. And precious metals is really the opposite. You know, you sell the rumor, the rumor being they're going to raise rates, the rumor being that they're going to start tapering. And you buy the, you, you, you actually buy the news when they actually do it because we don't believe um, that the Fed can actually effectively raise rates we don't believe the Fed can effectively start to taper without causing a pretty significant disruption in the marketplace. But because of that, because of that narrative right now, we have seen the market step away a bit from precious metals in general. Or I'd say another way to think about it is we've seen the market step away from risk off assets across the board, um, not just precious metals. When you have a stock, when you have a market like the S&P up over 20%, even the last couple of weeks where we've seen some volatility, the market's bounced right back. There's so much cash on the sidelines. So the need for risk off assets has all but evaporated. As long as you have an accommodating Fed, as long as you have the market delivering double digit returns, why have a risk off trade, right? So I think that's what's happening. What's interesting though, is people say, why hasn't gold done better? Or why hasn't silver done better? I would flip that around and say, uh, why haven't they done worse? And I say that because the fact that gold's sitting around 1750 to 1850 trading in that range and silver's around you know, 22, 23, $24 an ounce, um, I would say that if the S&P was up over 20%, I would expect those to be doing much worse than they are. And so we think that's a huge bullish sign longer term. So we welcome the narrative. We welcome um, the Fed trying to get back to business as usual. Um, ideally, the Fed sort of steps away and lets the market be a free market. Um, we do think the cream will rise to the top. We do think some companies um, that have been doing well will struggle because frankly, cost of capital has been so cheap for so long. Um, Warren Buffett says it best, you know, when the tide goes out, you'll quickly find out who's swimming naked and who's not. So, um, so we like that methodology and, and, and we want the market to actually reward those that are good actors, those that are doing well. So this short term or soft uh, sell off in precious metals, um, we think is temporary. We think longer term as the market uh, requires companies to be more accountable for their balance sheets, 
um, that will cause disruption, i.e. if they start to taper, i.e. if they start to raise rates. And, and we think gold is well positioned to take advantage of that. So short term, the volatility has been there. Short term, the, the asset class has softened. But mid to long term, we really like the prospect. Mm -hmm. And Ed, I think you've given us a good um, understanding of what you expect to see in terms of Fed Reserve action and the implications on gold, the precious mm -hmm. metals. But what about for gold equities? What do you expect to see in the next uh, months as well as years? Sure. Well, first and foremost, I always say, you know, physical first, right? So gold equities are a byproduct or a reflection of what's going on in the physical market. Um, if gold was selling off substantially, then the margins of these companies would be shrinking, they'd be contracting. Um, the fact that you know, all in sustaining cost for a mining company is around $900 to $1,100 an ounce. A lot of variables go into that, whether you're talking about an open pit mine versus a closed pit, where is that mine in, in, in the world? Um, is it a, uh, an existing mine that they're expanding or is it a new mine? There's a lot of variables that would go into that all in sustaining cost. Having said that, at 1750, 1850 range, these companies are wildly profitable right now, um, but no one cares, right? So things like cryptocurrencies, they're absorbing all the risk on allocations right now. Um, so physical has held up nicely. Physical has, has done its part, but that's a risk off trade, right? So that's something where people say, okay, I'm gonna use physical gold as a replacement or a complement to my bonds, or is a complement to my cash position, is a way for me to stay invested in the market, or if I'm putting new capital in the market at these current market highs in the S&P, um, I'm gonna use some physical gold to offset some of that potential volatility. On the equity side, that's more of a risk on trade. And so the, the equity story is more of a reflection of directionally what the price of precious metals is doing, going up or going down or staying the same. Yet, these companies are very profitable right now. You know, they have little to no debt, uh, many of these companies are either paying one-time dividends, creating dividend payout policies, or those that were paying dividends are increasing the dividend. In fact, I'm going to skip through a couple of slides here and, and, and get to a slide that I think is really interesting, which actually gives you the quality matrix of a lot of these mining stocks. And this, these numbers are really um, staggering to me when you think about the quality of these companies today. So if you think about something like enterprise value to EBITDA, right, it's more attractive. If you think about free cash flow, if free cash flow is a 2x to the S&P 500. Return on capital is higher. Uh, net debt to EBITDA is lower. These are lower leverage companies. And the profit margins are stronger. So these are ultimate value trades right now. But the, 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 the reason why people aren't allocating to precious metals, as I mentioned, the risk on trade is, is being absorbed by other assets like cryptos and, and like SPACs and you know, the special interest vehicles out there and stuff. Things that are, that are more dynamic um, than a traditional gold mining or silver mining or, or extractive industry type mining companies, uh, publicly traded stock, right? That used to be the old risk on trade. There's a lot of new things out there. So that's taken some of the, um, the interest away from that. But if you look at it from a pure quality standpoint, what I think is fascinating, what I think investors will find is this is a phenomenal value right now. The question is, is it a value trap or is it a value trade, right? A value alloc allocation. And ultimately, you have to look at the narrative for the physical market. If, if, if you believe that the physical market is stable and climbing over time, which we do, then the gold equities and the mining equities look like a tremendous value right now. So we obviously are selling our own book on this. We like to trade a lot right now. Um, you can go back and look at history. There's times we don't like the mining stocks. Um, it depends on what's going on in the global narrative for the metal itself. So we like them right now. We think the market is cautiously looking at them. Um, you only have to look at the last couple months when you had gold rallying two or three percent. The mining stocks were up 15 percent, 10 percent, some were up as much as 20 percent from an index standpoint. Individual stocks were up much more than that. So the torque component to these mining stocks is substantial. Um, we do believe that we'll, we expect to see gold you know, test new highs over 2000 in the coming quarters or years, given the global narrative. That will be tremendous for gold mining stocks. That coupled with the quality of their balance sheets um, is a really bullish sign for us. So we like them a lot. We fully understand why they're not performing better right now. Basically, the bottom line is people don't care right now. They will when you get a couple quarters behind you. But until that happens, I think you'll continue to see some volatility in that space. 
Well, Ed, you've given us a good understanding of the dynamics that are affecting gold as well as gold equities. And you mentioned the word narrative. So before yeah. we completely move away from the Federal Reserve, right. we have heard the word transitory being removed oh, from sure. the language. Yeah. So what does that mean for what we're seeing in precious metals as well as gold equities? Okay, so this is interesting because um, I'm not saying the Fed took any direction from me, but about two months ago, I was talking about transitory. And I said, let's define transitory. Is transitory six months? Is transitory two years? Is transitory five years? At what point did this stop being transitory? And when the Fed came out a couple weeks ago and said, we're dropping the word transitory from the inflation narrative, um, I had to smile with that because I think they realized that, yeah, everything is temporary, right? Everything's temporary. Now, is temporary a year or 10 years? We don't know. But, but the reality is that inflation um, is, is clearly going to be here for the foreseeable future. And things like real estate, things like hard assets, is it a step up? Are these a new permanent prices? Or is this going to be a prolonged um, you know, uh, inflationary type of environment for a while? So I think, I think it was right of them to actually drop the term. Um, but the reality is we just don't know, right? We don't know. Uh, some things may become cheaper over time. Uh, some things may become wildly more expensive over time. You know, if we are going to truly move into a carbon neutral footprint from an energy standpoint, you have to believe a lot of hard assets are going to go up in price, right? Um, those kinds of things are probably permanent. If you look at a uh, housing stock, you have to believe many of these communities, prices aren't gonna come back down. This is a very different market than 2008. So transitory, you know, asset class by asset class, maybe, but I think the Fed sort of woke up and said, you know what, this is probably gonna be around much longer than we anticipate. Um, again, self-serving for us, but that really serves the global narrative for precious metals in general. Um, we find over time that inflationary markets, um, all hard assets, tend to do very well in that environment, uh, particularly gold, because gold is really an alternative currency, right? If you think about gold, what is its purpose? It's a backstop to printing dollars. It's an alternative currency to hold value. It maintains purchasing power. And if you look at gold over multiple decades, it's kept up with and slightly outperformed inflation. And so those kinds of uh, narratives that go out there, when the Fed says something like that, we're dropping transitory, nerd or not nerd we're all high-fiving each other in the boardroom right like that's it's wonderful to get that type of backing and say okay this there's probably going to be more issues down the road not less and and precious metals in general uh loves nothing more than uncertainty um loves nothing more than change um that's where precious metals does very well so dropping that that narrative of of leaving off transitory when talking about inflation we think bodes very well for our space and Ed, that brings me to my next question, which is about portfolios. So you talked about volatility mm -hmm. and risk and how it affects gold as well as gold equities. So unlike the trend, uh, traditional 60-40 portfolio, right. what do you expect to see in terms of where gold and gold equities plays a part in the portfolio? Sure. I, I might get some hate mail on this from the bond managers out there, but there's a great quote in here that I like to show. Um, and it, it's, really, it's really something that John Hathaway talks about, um, which, which really speaks to bonds and speaks to the 60-40 model. Um, and unless you're managing duration or unless you're accepting low yields and holding a bond to maturity, a bond fund is, is now becoming one of your most risk on assets because if rates do eventually go up over time, um, you will see the bond prices roll over. And so, as John Hathaway likes to say, you know, bonds are dead as a portfolio diversifier in a 60-40 model. Um, again, no disrespect to bond managers, they earn, they earn their keep by trading duration and so forth. But the old set it and forget it uh, approach to 60-40 stock bond just isn't getting it done. And so things like alternatives in general, not just precious metals, but real estate and other assets out there are becoming a mandatory part of an allocation. So we're seeing gold from a narrative standpoint, we're seeing gold from an allocation standpoint, move out of the traditional commodity basket and into the alternative asset basket. You know, I've said it many times, I've said it on Asset TV many times, the, you know, the, the, the few actual people that watch uh, multiple videos of, of ours, um, uh, they've heard me say it, you know, gold's the original alternative, right? Gold is that asset that has traditionally over multiple market cycles zigged when the market has zagged, right? You only have to look back at history and see time and time again, Gold has done a wonderful job of protecting purchasing power. Gold has done a wonderful job of going up when the market's going down. And over full market cycles, gold 
ultimately keeps you invested in the market. And that's, you know, that's where I think gold can add value to a, a traditional 60-40 model. Maybe not replace your bonds, but complement your bonds with some physical gold. Uh, you know, maybe add some gold to your cash position. Use that as, as a portfolio protector. Use that as a, a preservation of capital type of allocation. So in the old 60-40 model, you know, unless yields go up two or three X from here, they're just not gonna drive the returns that they drove and they're not gonna provide the protection they've, they've provided in the past. So you do need to think outside the box and gold has certainly become one of those solutions. And Ed, I wanna shift gears and uh, move away from the physical market. You did touch upon this earlier um, and this is mining stocks. So how are they looking? Well, I'll tell you, you know, as I mentioned earlier with, with the quality of these, of these balance sheets, uh, they, look, they look great. And the other thing I would say is, if you think about management of these companies, most of the managers, rightly or wrongly, have been replaced since the market peak of 2011. And they're thinking about their businesses very differently today than they did back then. Making acquisitions at any cost, that's not happening anymore. Um, you, know, uh, you know, spending the, the, the absolute last hour to dig a little deeper, do those kinds of things, isn't happening anymore. They're thinking more logically about their businesses. The fact that they're paying dividends, they're, they're, they're acting more like a traditional business in that regard. Now you ultimately still need gold to be flat to positive for these companies to continue to have growth, but their margins look great, their management is strong, um, the communication level is better than ever, and they're becoming more relevant, right? If you think about all the things in this room right now and the things that we're doing, the technology we're using for these videos, those have silver in them, those have some gold, but really silver, other metals, things that come from the extractive industry in general. We can't function as a society without bringing things out of the ground. Whether you're talking about electric cars, windmills, solar panels, 5G network, you need hard assets to make all these things work. So we think the mining space is permanent, obviously, but also things like ESG are going to allow the cream to rise to the top. The better management companies, the better, the, the better actors, the better companies with balance sheets and communication, things like that are going to, you know, ESG is going to hold those companies accountable. And so we really like the narrative for the, for the mining space today. It's becoming on the forefront. People aren't just talking about it as a one-off trade. It's becoming part of the conversation. You know, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, you know, they're talking about the, the, the carbon neutral footprint, right? Being carbon neutral by 2050. Mining is part of that solution. So we, we really like the space right now from a quality standpoint, from a balance sheet standpoint, and from just an interest level standpoint across both aisles politically, as well as from an investor view. We, we, we think the space looks really attractive right now. And Ed, taking a closer look at the mining universe, when you compare it, um, what we're seeing in that sector in terms of market cap, number of companies, right. they are smaller. They so are, yes. What are your views on the space? Well, so often they say, gee, you know, Microsoft could buy the entire mining industry tomorrow. You know, Bill Gates could own all the mining companies out there. I mean, it's, it's a small market for sure. And, you know, most people understand what the S&P is. That's large multinational companies in many cases. They have a large global footprint. Um, and they understand, not as much, but most people understand what the Russell 2000 is. Smaller regional businesses, sometimes US-based companies, that kind of thing. But in the mining space, we use a little bit different narrative or a little different uh, tag just to confuse the world. You know? So we don't call them large cap and small cap, we call them seniors and juniors. But effectively, it's the same thing. So a senior mining company would be you know, one and a half, two billion dollar market cap or above. Um, in many cases, they would have multiple properties in multiple jurisdictions. They would maybe have a property at late stage development, have multiple properties in different phases of, of, of production. Um, maybe some phases they have another 10 years of, of extraction. Others, they may only have a few years left and they need to replace those reserves. That's gonna be a broad diversified uh, you know, mining company. Those are great companies, they're liquid companies. Um, they're companies that when the gold equity market starts to move, like we saw a few times this year, they're the ones that get the, the capital flow first. But longer term, we actually really like the junior mining companies. These are typically like a small cap company, like a Russell 2000 type company. Um, they're smaller in market cap, they're gonna be typically below a billion dollars in market cap. Um, they many times are single mines. Um, and many times they're late stage development, they're not even in production yet. Um, or their early production, and they've got a long runway. Uh, so we really like the small cap companies a lot, uh, the junior mining companies, as we like to call them. Um, and we think those companies can win in multiple ways. They can win through margin expansion, which we're seeing. Um, they can win by being acquired by a large cap company that needs to replace their reserves. Um, so there's a lot of ways that these small cap companies 
can uh, can win in this market cycle. So um, yeah, so senior would be large caps, junior would be small caps, and, and uh, it is a small market, um, but it's a dynamic market. And as I mentioned, you know, from a quality standpoint and from a management standpoint, uh, these companies look really great now. So we're we're probably more excited now than we have been in a while in the equity space. But yeah, large caps are junior, are seniors, and small caps are juniors. That's the way we think about them. Well, I think it's a very helpful overview since it can be confusing. Yes, it can. <laughs> and uh, speaking of the mining sector, what about the health of uh, the sector? What do you expect and what is your overall outlook? Yeah, well, you know, as I said, you know, the, the balance sheets are, are rock solid. They're, they're very healthy. Um, we don't see that going away anytime soon. You know, even if, if gold were to trade down to 1500, the margins are still there contracting, but still pop, still profitable. So I think the health in, in mining is very good. And what I would also say is, you know, so often people think about mining as just gold mining, and that's it. And there's so many different industries out there. Um, we see it on the equity side. We see it on the private lending side. Um, you know, we just recently, as I mentioned at the start of this uh, interview, that you know we've gotten into uranium, and it will not surprise me to see us get into other metals uh, in the coming years as it relates to battery technologies, you know, uh, lithium and cobalt and so forth. I expect um, you'll see us continue to, to have a voice because we are one of the larger firms out there. We do get more and more conversations with uh, people looking to deploy capital, and we tend to be first to a lot of these conversations. So again, you know, the mining space looks really great right now. And Ed, we've touched upon gold and you've also brought up uranium. Mm -hmm. So what are there any other metals you're watching or opportunities that you're seeing in the market? Yeah, I mean, everything, you know, you think about just the industry in general, you know, copper, you know, copper uh, gets talked about a lot, um, you know, uh, steel, all, all these different metals that are out there um, are, are interesting. We don't have products in all those metals, but it just, it just raises the awareness of what mining actually is, why it's needed, um, and, and how to invest in it. And I touched on it briefly, but we think the battery metals are something that are going to uh, be in higher and higher demand. And it's like silver, right? So if silver is at $25 an ounce versus $50 an ounce, you still need it to put it in a reflective technology for a car, into 5G networks, into solar panels. So they're still gonna buy it, the demand is still going to be there. Um, same with cobalt and lithium and so forth. So uh, electric vehicles are growing, not shrinking. Um, different parts of the world, uh, that, that's becoming the majority of the cars being manufactured. You can't walk down a street in New York City or drive on any major highway anymore without seeing an electric car. Um, so we think the battery metals market is very, uh, very interesting. And I suspect we'll have more and more involvement in that down the road as well because of the things I mentioned, because of our footprint on the physical side, our footprint on the equity side, and our footprint on the lending side. Um, and then just to circle back with uranium, you know, we like nuclear a lot. I mean, I know, I know in the past that's been sort of a, a, a dirty word, but the reality is there is no way we can go carbon neutral without nuclear. Um, and there's no way to do nuclear without uranium. And so uh, we think that part of the market is very interesting right now also. Um, and we think of it as a backup generator, it's not the energy source, but it's a energy source. If you look at what happened in the UK this summer, um, they had to fire up coal plants because the wind speeds, historical wind speeds died down. So the windmills weren't producing enough uh, energy. So those kinds of things are real issues. And so wind, solar, hydro, all those things are gonna be our future, but you still need a base load. And we think nuclear will be that base load. And we think uranium is gonna be a very important component um, to the future of, of mining in general. So. Um, as that market continues to, to move forward, uh, we're obviously going to remain engaged in that. We have almost a $2 billion uranium trust where we own physical uranium. Um, we announced earlier uh, this month that we're acquired a uh, uranium ETF that owns the equities themselves. So we're creating a huge footprint in that space as well. So I expect as, as you continue to learn more about us as a firm and, and see what we're doing, our reach will continue to broaden and really all precious metals and all uh, other metals that are out there, whether it's on the battery technology side, on the energy side, or the precious metals side. And Ed, before we wrap it up, I think we've had a very engaging conversation about what we're seeing in precious metals, as well as mining and uh, gold equities, as mm -hmm. well as the other metals that you just mentioned. But before you uh, depart, do you have any thoughts or words you'd like to leave with our viewing audience? Sure. Um, I'd say the biggest thing is, is, is to try not to fall in love with the asset class when it's working. Um, it's very addictive. 
right? So when gold starts to really work, and we saw this a little bit at the peak of COVID, um, new investors coming in for the first time, buying at market highs and so forth. But when, when, when precious metals starts to really work, you, you feel like you're the smartest guy in the room. You're like, how did not everybody see this, you know? And I would caution people that when it's really running, like you saw um, during the peak of COVID, you know, and it becomes an outsized part of your portfolio, you have to have the discipline to trim it back, right? Do not double down because it's a wonderful, wonderful way to lose a lot of money very quickly when you do that. Well, thank you, Ed, for joining me today. It's always great having you in the studio and I wish you a great holiday season. Yeah, you as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Thanks. And thank you for watching. I was joined by Ed Coyne, Senior Managing Director of Global Sales at Sprott. From the Asset TV studio in New York City, I'm Remy Blair.